How I got these boots. Just past Flagstaff, he appeared. A tiny grizzled man on the shoulder of Highway 64 with his thumb out, wearing a backpack bigger than himself. I pulled over a little ways past him and climbed out of the car and watched him waddle toward me. A tin canteen and a pair of hiking boots with red laces dangled from his pack, clanking together every couple of steps. His short white hair, creased face, smudged with dirt, rumpled jeans, and oil-stained sneakers gave him the look of a homeless track coach. Young man, thanks for stopping, he said, thrusting out of the hand. Name's John Malloy. Where are you headed? Where are you headed? The Grand Canyon, I said. His eyes sparkled. Bingo! Me too. In the car, headed west again, John told me his story. For 35 years, he'd worked in a machine shop in Lowell, Massachusetts. But his lifelong dream was to visit the Grand Canyon. He'd read dozens of books about it, studied its geology and its history, He'd even cut out pictures from National Geographic and pasted them to the wall above his bed. A few weeks before, he'd been talking about the Grand Canyon with the guys he worked with, and one of them had said, For Christ's sake, shut up already. What is it with you? It's always the Grand Canyon this, the Grand Canyon that. Like you'll never make it there, and it's depressing to hear you go on and on about it every damn day. John looked up at me with a mischievous glint. So I said to him, Okay, I quit. Turned in my tools and walked out. He'd scraped together enough money for a Greyhound ticket as far as Amarillo, said goodbye to his mother and his teenage son who shared his apartment, and hopped on the bus. It had taken him three days to reach Amarillo, and three more days to hitchhike 600 miles to Flagstaff. Now that he'd found a ride, me, to take him the rest of the way, he was shaking with excitement. I can't believe we'll be there in less than two hours, he said. He clapped his hands, he drummed on the dashboard, he rubbed his eyes and whistled at the sight of each towering cactus we passed. Then he peered at me. Say, you're pretty quiet. What you brooding about? I told him about my wrecked heart, the girlfriend who'd left me and moved to Scotland, how I hadn't dated or kissed another girl in two years. And now the girl I'd flown to Arizona to see, captain of the Phoenix Suns dance team, had let me down too. When I'd arrived, she told me about her new boyfriend, an NFL punter. It was actually the punter who'd suggested I check out the Grand Canyon. I've never been more lost, I said. Still, I felt lucky that I was about to witness someone realize their lifelong dream. My own dream seemed hazier and more impossible. I explained to John that I wanted to be a writer, but was so caught up in an unsolvable hurt and ache, I hadn't written a word in months. We passed the ranger station at the outer perimeter of the park, and for the next twelve miles, as we rolled closer to the edge of the Grand Canyon, John leaned halfway out his window like a happy dog, gulping up the first breezes of spring. His buzzing energy buoyed me and began to tug me from the darkness. At last we reached the first overlook, and John bounded from the car, sprinted toward the edge, and gazed out across the vast chasm for a few seconds. Then turned back toward me and shot two fists skyward, eyes wet, face shining. I took a picture of him and laughed out loud, exhilarated myself. We whipped it up for a minute, alone at the top of the world. The sun hung lower, and we hiked an hour down into the canyon. John, blissed out and bubbly, pointed out rocks and wildlife, gushing with information. This wasn't just run-of-the-mill, tour book stuff. It was endless. Not only was I blessed to be with someone in such a radiant state, I was also visiting the Grand Canyon with a guy who had seriously transformed himself into one of the world's top experts on the Grand Canyon. Finally, he fell into a kind of stunned, contented silence, and we made our way back up to the rim. The canyon hummed at our backs. We found the park campground and pitched a tent in the dark. It began to snow. John passed me his canteen. Have a sip of this, he said, grinning. It ain't water. In the morning, we drove down to the park office to see if we could stir up a job for John, working trail maintenance or guiding hiking tours. The head ranger, astonished at his depth of knowledge, hired him on the spot. I bought John a few days of groceries and paid for his campsite through the weekend. Look, John said, I can't let you just spend a hundred bucks on me. You gotta take these. He pressed his hiking boots into my hands. Before I could protest, he said, They don't fit me. I got the ugliest blisters you've ever seen. I'll do better on the trail in my sneakers. Here, take them. He gave me a hug. Now get on back to Chicago. I'll hold the fort down here. A year later, when I left Chicago and drove to New Mexico to follow my dreams of being a writer, I was wearing those boots with the red laces. On my dashboard was the picture of John Malloy at the edge of the canyon, fists raised toward the sky.